This is Economics for Entrepreneurs, the podcast where we apply the principles of economics to help you make the best decisions for your life and business. Here's your host, Hunter Hastings. Hi, Hunter Hastings here. We're exploring entrepreneurship as the best option for every one of us to create our own individual economy and to ensure that we feel economically enfranchised through our own initiatives. Entrepreneurship is the answer to your question about what kind of a life you can have if you want to take control rather than seed control. Today we're starting at the beginning by exploring ends and means. Those are terms for analytical tools that economists apply in understanding the motivations of buyers. When a customer makes a purchase of a good or a service from an entrepreneur, it's an action that they take, a choice that they make, to make progress towards an end, or as we might say, towards a goal or an objective. In fact, the action they take, the purchase of that service or that product, is a means to achieve the end. So the task of the entrepreneur is to identify the ends that customers are pursuing and to persuade them to choose the means that the entrepreneur is offering rather than choose a competitive offering, for example. You could say that the consumer or the customer makes the choice of ends and the choice of means rests with the entrepreneurs. If you're able to truly identify and truly understand the ends your customers are pursuing, you'll understand their motivations and you'll be able to fashion the most appropriate means for them to attain their ends. It's a critical skill for the successful entrepreneur, but it's not simple, which means it's an opportunity for you to excel by solving the equation better than others can. To discuss means and ends today, we are talking to probably the greatest expert on entrepreneurial economics in the world today, Peter Klein. Peter is Professor of Entrepreneurship at Baylor University's Hankammer School of Business. He's also Senior Research Fellow at Baylor's Bohr Center for Entrepreneurship and Free Enterprise and Adjunct Professor of Strategy and Management at the Norwegian School of Economics. His research focuses on the economics of entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial business organization. It would be pretty hard for us to gather more expertise in one individual for our subject today. Peter, hello. Hi, Hunter. How are you? Good. Thank you for joining Economics for Entrepreneurs. It is a pleasure to be with you today. Well, we hope you'll be a regular contributor, but today we're going to start at the very beginning. We're going to talk about ends and means. So please define ends and means as an economist would think of these terms. Yeah, well, as you know, uh, Ludwig von Mises titled his great treatise, Human Action, and that's not the way we normally think about economics, right? Uh, Adam Smith's book was called The Wealth of Nations, and so many people think about economics as being the study of wealth or um, how sort of productive assets are moved around in an economy. And while economics does deal with those things, In Mises' sense, economics is about something much more basic or fundamental, namely it's the systematic study of purposeful human behavior. And what Mises means by purposeful behavior is behavior that is goal-oriented, right? So the the distinctive characteristic of human action as opposed to, you know, the behavior of of animals or, or inanimate objects is that human actors always have some kinds of goals or objectives or ends in mind, and they employ means uh, as uh, to achieve those. I mean, just to use a silly example, uh, on the podcast now, I'm, I'm actually sipping some coffee as we're talking, and uh, you know, the coffee doesn't just sort of automatically float to my mouth. Um, I desire, I enjoy the flavor of the coffee, and I like the, the buzz I get from the caffeine, and when I want a drink of coffee, I reach down with my hand, I grab the cup, I pick it up, and you know, I put it to my lips and I drink. Um, everything that we do as human beings is goal-oriented in the sense that we have to, you know, our, our, the things that we want to achieve don't come to us automatically. We've got to do some thinking and planning, and we've got to employ some resources, our bodies, uh, our financial resources, um, tools, and so forth, to be able to achieve those ends. 
Well, good. That's a great start. Thinking about your uh, your morning cup of coffee as as part of the uh, the ends that we all consider. So let's stay in that arena of of consumers and customers and regular people going about their everyday lives. Does economics know how people decide on what ends they're aiming for? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, look, as as human beings and as sort of broad-minded social scientists, of course, we're interested in why people choose the things that they choose. There's a psych psychological aspect. There's a sociological aspect. I mean, Hunter, you are uh, uh, you were born and raised in the UK. So, uh, you know, I know you fairly well, but I don't know everything about you, but I would imagine that you like to drink tea. Maybe you prefer tea to coffee and maybe you like a warm beer rather than cold beer because those are things that British people typically like. My mother grew up in the UK and so I learned all about quirky British habits uh, from her. You know, why do you prefer the foods that you prefer? Why do you dress the way you dress? Uh, why do you like to live in a certain kind of home or why did you pursue a certain kind of career? I mean, I, I can, we can probably theorize about that and we can do some empirical study about you and your background and your culture. And that's all great and very important. But the way most economists uh, define the scope of economics is that economics is about the implications of the fact that people have particular ends. So economics is concerned with how people employ scarce means to achieve the ends that they desire. But we sort of take as granted that the ends are what they are. You know, to use a common example, look at something like smoking, right? I mean, from one, one person to another, as your friend, I would say, look, Hunter, you know, if, if you're smoking cigarettes, if you're smoking two packs a day, I think you probably shouldn't do that. Here's some, uh, you know, uh, Here's some good medical reasons and other reasons why I think that's probably not a good idea and and uh, it might not be good for your job prospects because in our culture today, smoking is kind of frowned upon. But if I know that you do in fact smoke two packs a day, uh, I can I can say something about your behavior just by looking at prices. I know that if the price of cigarettes were to rise, you would likely reduce your consumption. Uh, if someone brings to market a kind of alternative, you know, a, a, a nicotine patch or uh, some other kind of substance that can satisfy your craving for nicotine, but is uh, otherwise more desirable or is less expensive, I can predict or anticipate that you'll shift some of your consumption from regular cigarettes to something else. In other words, even though I may personally not approve of your particular ends, I can still analyze the implications of your desired ends or your preferences, even without rendering a kind of judgment on whether those ends are good or bad. Well, let's see if we can uh, help entrepreneurs who are listening a little bit, Peter, with that complex challenge of understanding consumers and customers' motivations and the and ends. So put it in that entrepreneurial context. I'm trying to understand my my customers' ends so I can bring them the right means, but you've suggested, hey, those those ends can change over time. They might change by context. I'll tell you mine have. I used to like warm beer. Now I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you lived in the U.S. for too long. Exactly right. Well, so my, my, my uh, ends, or maybe my means, have become uh, contextualized in the US and I, I now prefer coffee over tea as well. So in the in the challenging pursuit to understand the uh, the ends that consumers are pursuing, how can entrepreneurs do that investigation? How can they find out? How can they make decisions about what ends are gonna help consumers to achieve? Yeah, it's a great question, Hunter. And I think that successful entrepreneurs, practical entrepreneurs, tend to be jacks of all trades. In other words, to be successful in the marketplace as a business decision maker, you certainly need to know some economics. So you need to know, for example, that when uh, if the price of a good rises, uh, consumers will tend to demand less of that good, other things equal. That's something that is extremely important to know. But it's also important to know some psychology and to know some sociology and to know history and so forth. So I think that it, you know, entrepreneurs need to immerse themselves in the particular market, in the particular institutional context in which they are involved. If I'm 
you know, uh, if I'm selling coffee, it's very useful to do the kind of Howard Schultz thing, right? We all know that the Howard Schultz story of how he, you know, he spent time in Italy kind of getting a, a deep foundational knowledge, really letting it sink in, you know, through his pores. What does it mean to have a coffee culture? What's the experience of being in an Italian espresso bar? He used that knowledge, it was able to sort of translate that knowledge into a, a, a similar but different product that would work well in the American context. And of course, Starbucks has been phenomenally successful at introducing a new way of thinking about coffee, a new way of experiencing coffee, not just to you know urban sophisticates in Manhattan or in San Francisco, but you know, to soccer moms and, and farmers and people, you know, all, all over the U.S. and indeed all over the world. Now, how did he know that? Well, he had to have some insight, some understanding, some intuition about what Italian consumers got out of their coffee experience and what American consumers could conceivably get out of that same experience. What would make this product attractive to American consumers? Of course, he also had to know had to have some insight into production and marketing and finance and supply chain issues and so forth. But I guess my point is, uh, we I'm involved in entrepreneurship education at the university level. And one of the things we try to emphasize to our students is look, don't expect that as a 19 year old or a 22 year old, or maybe as a 35 year old, that you will read a book about X and immediately go and become the next, you know, great successful uh, uh, entrepreneur on X. You may need much deeper insight. So you may need to know the history of the product, the history of the market. You need to know something about consumer psychology. You need to have some marketing expertise and so forth. One of the things, by the way, that uh, great entrepreneurs often can do is, you know, they know what they know and they know what they don't know. Right, so it's relatively, uh, it's easy for them to, or I should say, they are skilled at finding other people who can sort of fill in those gaps. So you need to be, the successful entrepreneur needs to be not only a good judge of circumstances, not only a good judge of products and so forth, but also a good judge of other people so that you can find people who have the deep knowledge that you lack so that you can you know, fill in whatever gaps you may have as you engage in the behavior that you describe, namely figuring out what product is most likely to appeal to these consumers in this particular context. Yeah, I love your Howard Schultz story because that's a, an illustration of how that, that sense, that, that qualitative sense, that gut feel, that observation, that, uh, that diving into the culture led to, led to a great business. And I, Let's see if we can we can help people with a combination of that instinct and uh, economic tools. I know in in marketing when I was practicing in consulting, we used to use a tool called a means ends chain, and what that was was trying to use a tool to figure out that combination of observing consumers and figuring out what their ends were and why they chose certain means. So the, the bottom of that chain is, what's the thing? They, they choose a cup of coffee. The next step is, well, why? What's, what's the job that that cup of coffee is doing? And that might be refreshment. It might be a break. It might be um, some kind of stimulus. What's the feeling they get from that? What's the emotional benefit? Boy, I, I feel great that I've had this cup of coffee, or I feel great that I had a break in Starbucks, and, and now I feel mentally refreshed as, very, as well as physically refreshed. And at the end of that, there's some um, deep personal experience that um, I like as a result of that, that, that coffee break. So is that, is that a uh, realistic way of thinking about things? Or is it, is it too analytical and I should just be going with my observation and gut feel? No, no, I, I, I think that is a, a, an extremely important and useful way to think about uh, understanding the consumer, how the entrepreneur can make sense of what the consumer is doing, what the consumer is wanting. T to go back to our Starbucks example, and I think it's very, it's particularly salient in that case, 
you know, we want to distinguish between the good or service that is actually transacted in the market and the sort of ultimate end that the consumer is aiming to satisfy, right? And the genius of Howard Schultz was his realizing that you could import from this Italian model a kind of experience, you know, the third place, as they call it, right? A place to hang out, right. a place to, to socialize, a place to do business, a place to just enjoy the smells and the sounds and so forth. So that involves, of course, the layout of the stores and, and the decor and the other complementary products and the music and the marketing and so forth. But I think you've raised a really important distinction. The reason Starbucks has been so successful is because what the consumer you know, ultimately wants to buy is not a cup of coffee, but this kind of experience of being in the store and pr participating in that, uh, uh, you know, being part of that culture and so forth. But again, you don't buy and sell experiences. I mean, we, you know, people sometimes use that language, especially in, you know, travel agents and so forth. But really what they're selling you is a plane ticket or they're selling you a hotel reservation or they're selling you an itinerary. So again, what do you buy in Starbucks? You buy a cup of coffee or you buy a muffin or whatever. But that's, so, so you know, you, you have to have some, you have to be able to build a relation between kind of the ultimate objective the consumer wants to satisfy and the proximate thing that you can buy and sell. And if you convince the consumer that, hey, the way to get this experience that you desire is by purchasing this thing for three bucks or whatever that we can actually exchange, you know, and you can pay with uh, your app or the cash through the cash register or whatever. That that's really the key to you know a successful business venture. So it's it's you know uh, figuring out what that ultimate end is, figuring out what kind of proximate or immediate transaction can satisfy that ultimate that ultimate end, and you know kind of linking those things together. That's really the key to you know, being to, to appealing to the consumer and, and earning the consumer's dollar. Yeah, we used to say about the Starbucks third place idea that one of its attributes was you're always welcome. You can come in here anytime. You can do what you like. You can open up your laptop. You can listen to your iTunes. You can read a book. You can chat with people. You can eat or not eat. You can have a cup of coffee or something else, but you're always welcome. It's, it's open to you. And you become one of our family. You use our language. You start to say venti instead of a big cup and <laughs> things like that. You're exactly right. And I think there's an interesting contrast between Starbucks and say McDonald's, right? In the last 10, 15 years, McDonald's has really placed an emphasis on coffee, the McDonald's and McDonald's restaurants in the U.S. And, you know, there are some, uh, in some taste tests, you know, blind taste tests, McDonald's upscale coffee has actually done done quite well compared to more expensive alternatives. But the problem is when you enter a McDonald's, you're, you're consuming a different experience than when, when you enter a Starbucks. And you know, McDonald's, it's an interesting case that relates also to kind of the product portfolio or, or diversification strategy, because McDonald's is obviously trying to satisfy multiple, there are multiple kinds of experiences, right? Quick snack, uh, inexpensive meal, families with small kids, you know, people getting in and out quickly and so forth. Is that kind of experience compatible with what you just described, the feeling of not only being welcome, but, but it's okay for you to bring your laptop or a book and just hang out there for hours. That's really not consistent with the McDonald's model, which depends on kind of rapid customer turnover. So it's been much more of a challenge to McDonald's to try to satisfy multiple experiences with the same set of actual transactions and in the same building with the same seating and, you know, the same uh, uh, physical space and so forth. So, you know, again, another challenge for the entrepreneur is to, to figure out what are the appropriate limits, right, to the model that, uh, that, that, you know, you, that you find to be effective. Growth is obviously important for, for many uh, business people, if not most, but, you know, there's, there's a right and wrong way to, to, uh, achieve growth and trying to do it by, you know, being too many things to too many people is typically not a recipe for great success. Yeah. And it, is there a sense, Peter, as I think as of an entrepreneur in analytical mode, I'm trying to decide who to serve and I'm trying to decide what 
experience to deliver them. Is there really a sense in which customers or consumers are looking to compare different means? So I feel like a break. Do I actually compare drinking coffee to drinking tea or going to Pete's, which is a local chain here out in the West Coast, or going to Starbucks or going to McDonald's instead of Starbucks or doing something else? Do I, does the, the consumer go through that process, do you think? Is that a way for the entrepreneur to think about how to serve the consumer? Yeah, well, I think in most cases, it's a mistake to imagine the, the, the consumer as going through this kind of explicit calculative process. It's kind of a caricature of, you know, sort of many economists, sort of mainstream economists, that, that they, they think of people as these rational calculating machines. I think from, from the perspective of our kind of economics, so-called Austrian economics, we don't, we don't envision that at all right this this kind of analytical language that we're using now about people you know economizing on scarce means to achieve their desired ends you know that that's a language or an al analytical framework that we as 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 scientists as observers that we impose upon the consumer or we impose upon the transaction kind of ex post but no we're not imagining that people are you know getting uh, getting out pencil and paper or getting out their phones and performing some kind of complex optimization calculation every time they go into the marketplace. Now, some, you know, some people do, if you're planning an expensive purchase, uh, you're buying a house or a car or planning an expensive trip, you're a heck of a lot more analytical about it most of the time than if you're, you know, buying a cup of coffee, which is why I think this is a good, good entree for, uh, you know, emphasizing the importance of a concept that, as you know, is very important in my thinking about entrepreneurship, namely the idea of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. right? The consumer doesn't always know ahead of time which, which means will best satisfy the desired end. I mean, we, we make mistakes, right? We have ex post regret. We say, oh, I'm never going to that restaurant again. Well, it doesn't mean there was anything, you know, sort of irrational about that initial choice. But hey, you tried something out, you learned from your experience, you'll probably make a different choice the next time. The same is true even more so for the entrepreneur. And I think one of the keys to successful entrepreneurship is, you know, a kind of uh, call it flexibility. You know, in, in uh, entrepreneurship scholars talk about the pivot right? It doesn't have to be one specific discrete moment like that. But the successful entrepreneur is always aware that he or she is making business decisions under conditions of uncertainty. You don't know for sure that you're going to achieve the financial or other results that you desire. And you need to be prepared to make some adjustments, right? You have some beliefs about how you think things will turn out. You, you act in the marketplace, but you need to be prepared to make some adjustments if the results don't turn out exactly the way you desired. And I think that's just as important or more important from the you know, producer side as it is from the consumer side. Yeah, you used an interesting term earlier when we were talking about Howard Schultz and Starbucks, uh, and that was insight. And I understand insight as accumulating data, it could be uh, just observational data. I have this picture of Mr. Schultz hanging outside a coffee bar in Milan and just observing people. And he got that insight that it's a, it's a break that Italians take between doing X and doing Z. They pop in and do Y and take a quick cup of coffee and it's a social event. They talk to people, they have fun. It takes five minutes, they leave. So he developed an insight, which sounds like a, a skill, um, but one perhaps that could be developed. It sounds like it's deductive. I collect the data and then I try and figure out what it's telling me. It may be, as you say, a, a guess or it's uncertain, um, but is that the right way to think about insight? Hey, that's a great question, Hunter. I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm, I'm open-minded and, and, uh, uh, ecumenical right on this particular question. I think it really depends a lot on the individual decision maker and it depends a lot on the context. I mean, in, in, in my, you know, sort of academic research on entrepreneurship, I talk a lot about what you might call insight, 
I use uh, I use the the term borrowed from Mises understanding. I also use the term judgment, which comes from the uh, American economist Frank Knight as well as Mises. You could call it insight or intuition, but really what I have in mind is um, you know something broader than what we might consider a psychological notion of insight, right? So the psychological notion is this, you know, this kind of aha moment and you, which you just, you, you can't break, you can't break it down. You can't, you can't analyze it. You can't, uh, uh, you know, put it into pieces or something. It's just sort of this tacit and intuitive, oh, wow, gosh, I just sort of get it in a flash of insight. Now it may, you know, the, entre the entrepreneur's understanding may come in that way. You know, other other folks are more analytical, right? I mean, you've got left brain and right brain kinds of people, or or system one versus system two kinds of thinking. As uh, I think, uh, I think it's uh, Dan Daniel Kahneman has popularized yeah. that kind of language. And it's you know, it's, look, there's some very successful entrepreneurs who are more analytical and they are more data driven, and they don't trust their own kind of intuitive judgment because they're worried about making a mistake or being biased or whatever. I think really what we mean by judgment in this sense, you know, is kind of the ultimate decision to go or not to go, right? The, the plunge decision, uh, as they call it. Even the most analytical person, even the person who relies to, to you know, raise a very important contemporary issue, who relies a lot on big data or uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence, ultimately a human being has to make the decision at the end of the day, are we gonna proceed or not? Right, a machine, uh, a, you know, a very ex uh, extensive and elaborate marketing survey, that's all information that the entrepreneur can use to make a decision, but the machine can't make the decision for you, right? The data can't tell you to proceed or not to proceed. That's what only a human entrepreneur, you know, can ultimately do. Now, the extent to which the human entrepreneur relies on kind of formal methods and, and, and data as opposed to subjective, tacit, and intuitive feelings. Well, that's going to vary from person to person. That's going to vary from case to case. I think either approach is completely legitimate as a means of making good decisions. One of the things that we would say in, in uh, business or in marketing to that point would be, hey, the, the, the insight is uncertain, as you say. It's, it, it, it might be a guess, it, it, it's qualitative, it's intuitive, and so on. Um, but before I make that go, no-go decision, I can certainly test it. I can develop some kind of a, uh, a test hypothesis to see if consumers respond to the offering that's inspired by the, by the insight. Would you, would you concede that, that we can, we can do some testing of our insight? Oh, ab absolutely. Uh, a colleague of mine has... Uh, done a very interesting study using Italian entrepreneurs where they put, uh, they had a sort of a, a treatment group and a control group, and they put the treatment group in a, 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 a training program that emphasized kind of, you know, testing according to so-called scientific methods, right? Formulating hypotheses, uh, gathering experimental evidence on these hypotheses, and then trying to uh, uh, up, update, you know, falsify some and then update beliefs and so forth using more kind of rigorous analytical methods. And they found that those entrepreneurs who had been exposed to that treatment, that, that training program actually tended to, to do better than the control group in terms of, you know, how to, how to incorporate or make sense of certain kinds of experiences along the lines you described. So absolutely right. I think that we can, uh, we can learn to do better. We can we can get some training and so forth to, to help us to make sense of the feedback that we get. But again, at the at the end of the day, you know, how do you design that kind of a program? What you know, what data are relevant and what data are not relevant? What's the right way to interpret the results of an experiment? Right, even that relies on kind of human understanding. It's one of the things that uh, you know. Uh, I think about a lot when I listen to kind of you know public public uh, discourse about you know so-called scientific issues, whether it's climate change or who knows what it is, right? In the popular mind, there's this completely radical distinction between you know science with a capital S, and I'm doing the little air quotes in my hand as I say that, and you know 
I don't know, belief or, or, uh, or religion or intuition or whatever it might be sort of on the other side. But, but in fact, science is also a human endeavor. And, you know, how, an exp how a scientific experiment is designed, how the data are collected, what data are considered legitimate or not legitimate, how the analysis is done, how the results are interpreted, all of that is also a human activity. And we can make mistakes in doing that. We can be subject to various biases. We need to have a sound understanding, good intuition, or good judgment about how to do a scientific experiment. So I absolutely agree with you that where appropriate, those kinds of data-driven methods should be used. But to me, that's not a challenge to the claim that there's ultimately a kind of subjective human element to entrepreneurial decision-making. It reinforces that point rather than challenges it in my mind. Yeah, of course, I was, I was uh, not trying to suggest otherwise. Uh, a lot of the thinking in the artificial intelligence community now is that the, the future lies in this finding the, the combination between machine learning and human empathy and human emotion. And there's, there's, there's creativity there, there's uh, inspiration there, there's, there's things that the, only the human can do, but the human plus the machine is going to be uh, so much better than the, the human only. But let's not... You're right, and, I, and I'm sure, I, I believe, as I'm sure you do too, or what I find fascinating is thinking about, you know, kind of the limits to artificial intelligence. Right? What, what are the ways that we can use the information provided by those kinds of techniques? You know, where, where do we sort of draw the boundary line between what machines can do and what machines cannot do? To me, that's the, that's the most interesting question. You, you hear these sort of, you know, both optimistic and dystopian, you know, ideas about, about the role of the machines in the future. But uh, no, we know that a designed machine is not, you know, cannot ultimately replicate everything that human, that human beings can do. It's figuring out how best, how these things can best complement each other is, you know, that's the real, that's the real challenge and the real exciting, exciting thing to, to think about. That'll be a great discussion for another time. I do want to come back, though, to this, this uh, means and ends connection and think about it for the, the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur is, already, uh, is also rather uh, pursuing ends and trying to choose means. And you mentioned uncertainty earlier, Peter, and one of your wonderful expressions in one of your papers is uh, the situation of absolute uncertainty. And I, that's a scary term if you're an entrepreneur. And I... The, uh, I give you my layman's interpretation and, and then you can refine it. It's that uh, you don't know what inputs to use because you've got a lot of choices and you don't know which one is best. And when you choose, you don't know what the output is going to be because <laughs> you don't have that information either. So that, that combination is uh, absolute uncertainty. I'm sure you can define it better for our listeners, but maybe you can talk about that and talk about the uh, the narrowing of options that you prescribe in that situation. Sure. Well, uh, you know, if we go back to this means and ends distinction, and then we layer uncertainty on top of it, right? As you've just as you've exactly explained, you know, we can be uncertain about what ends we wish to accomplish ourselves. You know, what commercial ends, what kind of uh, what kind of business we want to establish, what kind of products we want to produce. We can also be uncertain about the best means to achieve a particular objective. If we're uncertain about both, we're a lot more in the dark, so to speak, than if we're uncertain about only one. In other words, in other words if I know exactly in my mind, I've already decided the kind of, uh, you know, the, the kind of venture that I want to create, and I have a very um, uh, detailed vision in my mind of, sort of how that business will, you know, what things will look like when that business is running the way I want, but I just don't know how to get started. I don't know what resources I need. And that's better than being in a position where I don't even know what the, uh, what, what the likely ends, what the feasible ends uh, uh, can be. So one way to deal with that situation of absolute uncertainty, you don't really know what you want to do and you don't know how to do a thing that you might want to do, is to try to focus on, you know, one or the other but not both. In other words, think of a sequential process. So one process might be to think first about ends. Okay, here are 25 potential business ventures or kind of 
market circumstances that I can envision. Let me choose one that I think is likely to work best for me. And then once I've done that, now let me figure out what kinds of means do I need to be able to achieve that particular end. But we could also take another path, right? We could say, well, look, I, I don't really know what I want to do. There are lots of different things that I can imagine doing and, and being successful at doing. Let me start with the means that I already have. So I could look at my own kind of, uh, you know, my own talents and temperaments, my, my physical resources, my financial resources, my, my social networks, who do I know? What skills do I possess? What, what skills or resources can I easily acquire? And then say, well, what's the best business venture that I can build out of those things? So I could start with what I want and then try to get the means to achieve that end. Or I can start with the means I already have and then figure out what's the best end that I, I can achieve using those means. Now, I, you know, I've thought about this uh, in the paper that you're referring to uh, as kind of a sequential process from an analytical point of view. But of course, it's possible that the practicing entrepreneur might be thinking about these things simultaneously rather than in a kind of a discrete temporal sequence. But I think it, you know, it's worth pointing out, and I'm certainly not the first person to point this out, that you know, many times in a business venture, we, we really don't know what kind of a venture is the best fit for, for us. But we say, look, here's some things I know how to do. Let me start with these things that I'm good at and see if maybe incrementally, kind of experimentally, I can come up with a great business that takes advantage of these resources that I already have, these skills that I already possess, these things I feel comfortable with, rather than assuming that people always start with a blank slate right? I can be anything I want to be. This is what I want to be. Now I'm going to go out and, you know, go for the gusto and get whatever I need to accomplish that end. That may not be realistic in many cases, and it's probably not the way most of us, uh, you know, go about uh, sort of fumbling and stumbling through life. Yeah, and in that paper, as I recall, you illustrate the principles you're talking about with the, the uh, history of Netflix, where Reed Hastings and his partners started out mailing CDs and red envelopes because that was a better option for some people in some circumstances than going to Blockbuster. And then several years later, he ends up as uh, king of the streaming universe, which no one had even anticipated when when uh, Netflix got started. So right. everything changes. And That's right. I think very few of these kind of, uh, you know, revolutionary, disruptive entrepreneurs, whether it's Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or Reed Hastings or Howard Schultz or whatever, you know, could have imagined before they started exactly how things would turn out. Now, the reason this is, uh, this is, uh, you know, it, it's important to emphasize this because I think in a lot of the books and articles and videos that you see about entrepreneurship, people kind of downplay this point that we don't always know where, you know, what, what lies at the end of the road when we get started. Uh, a, a famous um, uh, Harvard Business School professor named Howard Stevenson defined entrepreneurship in a way that people sometimes refer to this as the Harvard Business School definition of entrepreneurship, something like the pursuit of opportunity without regard to resources currently at hand. And I sort of get what he has in mind. What he means is, hey, if you, you know, if you, if you can imagine some business opportunity in the landscape, what you perceive to be an opportunity in the market. If you can go for it, go for it by all means, try as hard as you can to obtain whatever resources you need to make that happen. But it's naive to think that that is the typical path of the successful entrepreneur. You know, many times we start with what we have and we try to do the best with what we have because hey, there's so many twists and turns in the entrepreneurial journey, especially in our you know, fast-paced, rapidly changing, high-tech, global environment. You know, it, it's just not very likely that but, you know, between the time you start and the time you finish, you're going to end up exactly where you thought you were going to go before you started. Right, and the, the key is to start. So I think we've used up most of our time today, Peter. I'll, I'll ask you one more question and then... Um, I hope that we'll be able to have you come back and talk to us more about entrepreneurship. But focusing on this means and ends 
uh, conundrum or the challenge to identify the right ends and the right means. Just narrow it down. Indulge me in uh, in the question. You said that entrepreneurs need to be uh, quite broad in their in their skills and and in what they try to do. Um, but is this economics or is this psychology or is it some combination of both? I think it's both for sure. And I, at the same time, I don't want to overly into, you know, intellectualize it. So when we talk about having deep knowledge of the particular phenomenon, market, your potential customers, you know, it doesn't mean you have to have a PhD degree. It doesn't mean you have to read a thousand books. For some people, it may be uh, you know, knowledge that you have and you don't really even know you you have. To give you another example, my, uh, my, my late father-in-law was a very successful residential real estate developer. And he was not, uh, you know, he was not a, a formally educated man with lots of degrees and certifications and so forth, but he specialized in one geographic area. He specialized in one customer segment. He specialized in one kind of type of residential development. And he really knew deep down in his bones, in his gut, he knew everything that you could know about the market, about the buyers, about the process of building houses and, and selling houses and about, about real estate in that area. You know, and I think he, he acquired this knowledge through years and years of experience, right? So yeah, look, I mean, the great entrepreneurs, they understand markets. They know how markets work, but they also understand people. They know what makes people tick, at least in some particular area of, of, uh, of human life doesn't mean they have to, to to learn it in a formal way. They may learn it in a very intuitive way. Uh, but that speaks to a, a point, a related point that uh, we've sort of hinted around, uh, sort of danced around today, but but we should make more explicit. And that's that experience, you know, is really important. I think because of, you know, the, the, the cases like Steve Jobs and, and Mark Zuckerberg and so forth, we often think of successful entrepreneurs starting out when they're teenagers or in their early 20s, and some do. But in the U.S., you know, the average age of the successful first-time entrepreneur, depending on the survey that you look at, you know, is, is mid to late 40s. So most people who are good at engaging in entrepreneurial practice are people who have some life experience with some product, with some industry, in some area, in some context. And you know, the, the successful, the best entrepreneurs usually embrace this lived experience and build upon it. And in, in a sense, that's, uh, uh, you know, I think that's a very welcoming and inviting aspect of entrepreneurship. Yes, entrepreneurship is difficult. Uh, success rates can be small and many sec can, can you know can be low in many sectors in, in, in many different markets. But entrepreneurship is not rocket science. You don't have to be a, a PhD. You don't have to be a trained engineer. You don't have to be this or that to be a successful entrepreneur. You have to know your market. You have to know your customers. You have to trust your judgment. Trust your instincts, broadly defined, as we've been talking about it, and uh, you know, and and be willing to to give it a shot. Yeah, and the other thing that strikes me about experience, Peter, I I see a lot of young entrepreneurs in the venture capital fund that I work for, and a lot of them are straight out of MIT or or Berkeley or wherever it might be, and the one resource they don't have and they can't have is experience, and we try very hard to figure out how to share experience. Is there an intergenerational kind of entrepreneurship where uh, somebody who's experienced by dint of age, they've, they've tried various things, can share with someone who is um, super entrepreneurial but just doesn't have the experience? Have you ever thought about, investigated that intergenerational idea? Oh, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, a, a lot of, a lot of, you know, a, a lot of the great uh, uh, successful ventures are family firms or multi-generational firms. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's, it's an, kind of an unfortunate uh, aspect of our youth, youth-obsessed culture, right, that we tend to discount the role of, of familial experience. But uh, no, that's an extremely important source of, of, uh, of, of knowledge, of entrepreneurial knowledge. 
There are challenges with multi-generational businesses as well, of course. Sometimes the second or third generation uh, members of the second, third, whatever generations, maybe they, maybe they don't share the same vision or have the same desire as the founder, but uh, absolutely where appropriate, uh, we should learn from the experiences of those who have come before us, family members or others. Right, and that, that kind of mentor-mentee relationship is, uh, is a good one to develop. So I think, I hope we've helped entrepreneurs who are listening today. You certainly have shared a lot of your knowledge and experience and, and research and insights. So uh, we thank you very much, Peter, and uh, we hope you'll come back soon and we'll have another topic. Uh, Hunter, thanks for having me. It's been great talking to you. I look forward to doing it again. Very good. And that's it, everybody, for today at Economics for Entrepreneurs. Thanks for listening, and tune in next week when we'll continue to explore the economic principles that can help you make smarter business decisions and grow your business. Thank you. Economics for Entrepreneurs is a production of the Mises Institute. To explore more content like this, visit Mises.org. That's M-I-S-E-S dot org. For more from Hunter Hastings, check out HunterHastings.com.